Good evening, welcome everybody. Baruchim Haboyim. The Mimer of the Alter Rebbe that we're going to learn tonight, a part of a Mimer, begins with Az Yashem Moshe. It was said in the year Tov Kuf Samach Gimel. That would be in the English, in the secular calendar, that would be 1803. Tov Kuf Samach Gimel. And it's in Torah Ur, Parshas B'Shalach. Tov Samach Beis, Amud Beis. The way the Torah and the look of the Torah were published is each daf consists of four columns. Each Amud, each page has two columns. So the way they reference my Mariam and Torah Ur and look of the Torah would be Shalach, Tav Samach Beis, Amid Aleph, Amid Beis, Amid Gimel, Amid Dalad. Unlike in Gemara, we have Amid Aleph, Amid Beis, because there are four columns, so it's Amid Aleph, Amid Beis, Amid Gimel, Amid Dalad. So Amid Gimel would be the right column of page two, and Amid Beis would be the left column of page one. So this Mimer is Tav Samach Beis, Amid Beis. You should just have this for future reference. So let's begin inside. Az Yashir Moshe Uvne Yisrael as Ashira Hazois Lashem Vayom Rule Moy Ashira Lashem Kigo Igo Sus Verech Verama Vayom. So after the Jewish people pass the Yamsuf, the Red Sea splits and they cross it, so the Shira is sung. And the way the Parsha describes it, this Shabbos, Shabbos Shira, Parsha's Bashalach is that then Moshe and the Jewish people sang the song to Hashem, and they said, Ashir la Hashem, let me sing to Hashem ki goi go, because he, ex- he is exalted above the exalted ones. A horse and its rider he hurled into the sea. He ne lahavin inyin kriyas yamsef. To understand what was the theme behind kriyas yamsef. One of the Yisaitis in Torah, especially in Kabbalah and in Chassidus is, that every concept, every event had much significance. In other words, Kriyas Yamsuf was a great miracle. But why this miracle? Hashem could have performed the same objective through many other methods. So there has to be some idea, some theme that was being conveyed through the specific episode of Kriyas Yamsuf. What was behind Kriyas Yamsuf? He doesn't want to understand the physical dynamics of Kriyas Yamsuf. That's not the focus of Torah Ur. He wants to understand the Indian of Kriyas Yamsuf. What was the message behind it? What was it expressing? The Gam, more, even more so. And this second question will only intensify the first and prove the need for an explanation. According to the route that the Jewish people took out of Mitzrayim, they weren't heading towards the Yamsuf. At some point, Hashem said, V'yashuvu, return back. Go backwards, as though you're going back to Mitzrayim. Pare will think you're confused and you're lost. So in other words, it's not that the Yamsuf was en route, and they had to get to a certain destination. They had to get to Har Sinai. They had to get to Eretz Yisrael. The Yamsuf was there stopping them. So he had to split the Suf. He says that wasn't even the Derech. The route, the route of the Jewish people was not supposed to take them through the Yamsuf. Elamai, he wanted there should be Kriyas Yamsuf for the sake of Kriyas Yamsuf. Kriyas Yamsuf wasn't just an incidental miracle in order to achieve the objective of the journey because it wasn't part of the journey. Furthermore, Vagam loyavru asayam meyeva leiver. This Dalta Rebbe is quoting, even though he doesn't give a reference from a Toysvis. The Toysvis in Erkin Dav Tesvav Amid Aleph, Masech the Erkin Dav Tesvav, Toysvis proves from Chazal that the Jews did not cross the, the sea from one side to the other side. Actually, they went out, it was like, they made like a semicircle. They went out from the same side that they went in. So it wasn't, it wasn't even that, again, that this was the derech, this was the path. Actually, they went out from the same side they went in. So what does this mean? It means that the objective was not to get to the other side. The objective was the splitting of the sea per se, independently. The question is why? Why was, 
Why was this a necessary miracle at this point? So you might say, well, he wanted to finally get rid of the Egyptians, but there's different ways to get rid of the Egyptians. Again, there was Makas Pchoyrus, there was Dever. There were so many different methods throughout history. There would be a story with Sancheirim. There would be a story with Sisera, etc. But the fact that Kriyas Yamsuf was chosen means that there is some message that the Jewish people had to experience. Becoming a nation, leaving Mitzrayim on the way to Matan Torah, before they could receive the Torah, receive their mandate as a people, they had to have a certain experience. And that experience was Kriyas Yamsuf. Parting a sea that was, that, uh, going through a sea that parted. And the question is, what? What was the toichen of this? Today, there's actually interesting research. You know, with recent generations, there was a lot of excavations done in that, uh, in that region uh, to try to figure out which, what exactly was the Yamsuf. Usually, it's translated as the Red Sea. Today, many believe it was the Gulf of, of Aqaba, which crosses into Saudi Arabia, but Egypt shares one of the ports there. Um, I believe that some years ago they found uh, lots of wheels, lots of galgalim on the bottom of that sea. But uh, this is an interesting discussion, exactly what was the route out of Mitzrayim. But clearly, according to uh, all the sources, the objective was Kriyas Yamsov. The objective was not to get to a certain destination. They were actually going out of the way to get to Yamsov, and this is the Alter Rebbe's point. Hatam, so to understand this, to understand the reason, Hatam, Ksiv, Ayedu, Mitzrayim, Ki'ani, Hashem. The reason says in Chumash, in the beginning of Parshas B'Shalach, Hashem says, I'm going to make Parai and his soldiers, his troops, even more stubborn, and they'll chase you, and they'll pursue you. The Yedu Mitzrayim and Egypt will find out ki ani Hashem that I'm God. We say it every morning in Shachas before Shemayin Esrei. The water covered their oppressors. Not one human being remained standing. So where's the grace of Yedu Mitzrayim ki ani Hashem? They were all gone. They were all obliterated. I want to uh, ingrain in them an awareness. Ingrain in who? In people that just a little while later were eliminated from the world. So where is the V'yedu Mitzrayim Kenya Hashem? Allah Inyan, the explanation in all of this is by prefacing, Ki hine yesh Mitzrayim b'chal Adam b'chal Zman. This is of course a con- continuous theme in Torah B'chlal, especially in Pnimi Yisat Torah, especially in Chassidus, that Mitzrayim exists in every person and it exists at every time. Mitzrayim is not just a geographical location we call Egypt and North Africa. And the story of the exodus of Egypt occurred 3,300 years ago. There's a Mitzrayim in every single person. There's a Mitzrayim in every single era, milieu, every single day. And therefore the whole story of Golos Mitzrayim, Golos Mitzrayim, Kriyas Yamsov, the Makas, Paroi, Moshe, Aaron, everything that goes on there is a timeless story that takes place in the human psyche, in the human mind, in the human heart, irrelevant of when you're living or where you're living. In other words, the stories recorded in the Torah are timeless stories because they each symbolize phenomena, reality, dynamics, struggles, dilemmas, and issues that we deal with on a daily basis. This is why Chazal said in the Mishnah Mesech the Psach in the last chapter. Arve Psach, and we say it in the Haggadah, Behold, Adam So it's not just a historical obligation. In every generation, a person should imagine as though he went out of Mitzrayim. If you say Pshat is simply to remember the past, how can you say Kilu Hu Yatsum in Mitzrayim? I never left Mitzrayim. I was never in Mitzrayim. I never left Mitzrayim. You could say it's important to remember what happened to your ancestors. History is important. I got it. But what's Pshat? Kilu Hu Atzma Yatsum in Mitzrayim. And if Chazal, if the Torah demands it, that means it's a reality. You can't dem- You make a demand from somebody, and it's such a serious demand that's really not possible emotionally. 
it's not, it, it's, it's cruel, it's unjust. So we keep on repeating, Kilu hu yatsamim et So it becomes, a, you know, I don't have to tell you, you know, how many times we say it. But what does it really mean? So the Alter Rebbe says, unless you can find the Mitzrayim in you, <laughs> and you can find the tools of leaving your own Mitzrayim, then you can't experience the Bechol Doi Vadoi Chayev Adam Lir Yisatsu Bechil Yatsam Mitzrayim. So if that, you have to have two things. First of all, you have to identify Mitzrayim. But that's not enough. I mean, that's important. That's step one. If you can't identify Mitzrayim, then you can't leave Mitzrayim. But step two, but some people identify Mitzrayim, and they remain in Mitzrayim. They even enjoy it. They even enjoy it. They make a career out of therapy. But, uh, but uh, the step two is you have to find the tools to leave your Mitzrayim, to cross the, to cross the sea. But the, but the first thing is the awareness of Mitzrayim, and then Gulas Mitzrayim. Uksiv, the Pasuk says, and this is, of course, not just a, gener- a commandment to that generation. It's a commandment to all generations. We mention Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim every day because it says, Kol As the Haggadah explains, day and night. So again, what's the point? The point is because the experience exists throughout your life. But there's something else. It says in Taisefta, Taisefta Brach is the beginning of Perig Beis. Taisefta says the biblical obligation to remember Yitzhak Mitzrayim every day, day and night, includes not just leaving the land of Egypt, also Kriyas Yamsov, which is the reason that Chazal and Sheknesses Agdoila instituted that in the Brach that we say after Kriyashma, before Shemin Asra, we speak at length about Kriyas Yamsov and Ezra Saviseinu, as he quoted earlier. Yamsov lem bakatav, as Edim tibatav, as Edim havarta. You remember? Vayichasamayim tzereim, echad meim lenoisi. You might even say it tomorrow morning and think about it. Al zoyz shibchu ahuvim. So therefore, it's a toisefta that that's part of the chiyuv. What's the point here? It's all leading to the same nakuda. You have to identify the Yamsuf in your own life, just like you have to identify the Mitzrayim in your own life, because it exists in every person and every, in every day, every, and every day. And hence, there's a certain re-experience of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim and Kriyas Yamsuf that ought to be incorporated into the life of the Jew mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and psychologically every single day. What is this? So the Alter Rebbe will now give an introduction and then he will get into the actual explanation of Kriya Samsov. Now, there's going to be terminology here that is somewhat new. It's novel. It's not the regular terminology that we may be used to. But, try to get at least the general picture, and I'll try to explain at least the main Akudus to the best of my ability, Bezer Hashem. The explanation in this is Kihine Amru Razal. Chazal say the famous mission at the beginning of Prikhi Yavis that Shimon Atzadik said, Al Gimel Dvarim Ayla Maimel Atayra Valavayda Vagmul Chasadim. The world has three pillars Tayra, service, and loving kindness. And here we're going to focus on Avayda. Avayda, Heine Nakar, which is one of the pillars of the world. Avoida is usually referred to the Avoida of the Karbonus, the Avoida in the Beis Hamikdash, right? The Rambam. We spoke a few weeks ago about the Rambam in the Sefer Mishnah Torah Yad Chazaka, the book that's dedicated to the Beis Hamikdash, is called Sefer Avoida. Avoida in Pirkei Yavis means the Avoida in the Beis Hamikdash, the Avoida of Karbonus. What happened? Chazal say, in the time of Bayis Rishon, there was a fire that came down from heaven on the Mizbech. It says in Zoyar, it was a coal that looked like a lion. It was a fiery a coal, a fiery coal shaped like a lion, which used to consume the Karbonus. In addition to that, the Kayanim were obligated to create their own fire on the Mizbech. The Gemara says, Mitzvah lohavi mina hediyet. But there was also the Eish, Sheyoriyad min Hashemayim. In other words, a combination of two fires. There was the fire generated by the people below. And there was the fire that came down from heaven and remained on the Mizbeach. Once the Beis was destroyed, Chazal instituted. Tefillah in lieu of the Karbonas. How can Tefillah substitute Karbonas? 
Dahainu, because Tfila is the same idea. Limser nafshei habaham is shetuchlal be'eshal mailo. There is the physical animal, but there is the psychological beast. There is the animal within each person. There is the beast within each person. And during davening, I take my behema and tuchlal be'eshal mailo. You want it to be consumed in a spiritual fire, in a spiritual flame. Pchines avarabah bomil mailo visarusa deleila. This is the fire of love that comes from above. It's an arousal. It's harusis, it's oirus, that comes from Hashem. During davening, there is that fire available. And I want to take my behemoth, just like physically in the Beis HaMikdush, you took the behemoth and you offered it on the Mizbeach. Here you take your inner animal during davening and you want to sublimate it. You want to allow it to experience a heavenly fire. Where do we have in davening, however, the concept that a fire comes from above? That's the reason why the An, when they wrote the Shmoneser, the text of Shmoneser, which was written when? In the beginning of the time of Bayesheni. The Rambam and Hilchas Tfila elaborates in the beginning of Bayesheni, that's when the Anshei Knesset Zagdoyle instituted the text of davening as they instituted most of the brachas and generally a lot of the nuschoyas of our davening. It wasn't in Bayis Rishon. In Bayis Rishon there was no text for davening. In Bayis Rishon everybody davened according to their own heart. You could daven for one minute. You could daven for 30 seconds. You could daven for nine hours. In Bayis Sheni they created a text. And in that text in every single bracha you say again, Baruch Atah Baruch Baruch Atah Hashem, Magen Avram, Chaya Meisim, Akel Hakadosh, Chaynen Hadas, etc. Baruch Atah Hashem. Vuhu, what's Baruch Atah Hashem? So we translate it, Blessed are you, God. Blessed are you, Hashem. So he says, Avuhu al derech mashakasuv. It's similar to what it says in Tehillim. Baruch Tehillim Kapitel Kovav, right? Baruch Hashem Eleke Yisrael. Min ha'oylam va'ad ha'oylam. David HaMelech says, Blessed is Hashem, min ha'oylam, va'ad ha'oylam, va'amar kolam, amen, hallelujah. From the world to the world. What does it mean, min ha'oylam, va'ad ha'oylam? So the Alter Rebbe teaches, min ha'oylam, va'ad ha'oylam, pirush, me'almedis, kasyil almedis gali. Baruch Hashem, Hashem is mevurach, from the world to the world, from the almedis, kasya, which means the hidden world to the revealed world. The Hainu, in other words, Bibchin is Soiviv Kalalman, the Mamalakalam. Min Ha'ilam from Soiviv Kalalman to Mamalakalam. These are two terms from Zoyhar. It says in Zoyar, Hashem is Mamalakalam and Hashem is Soiviv Kalalman. But there are two terms that play a central role in the teachings of Hasidus, especially Hasidus Chabad. And these two terms will be discussed in a few moments quite at length, relatively speaking. But we have Soiviv, we have Mamale, we have Alma de Skasya, we have Alma de Zgalia. Just get the terms in your mind. Ki Havaya Hua Elikim. As the Pasik says in Malachim, we said at the end of Yom Kippur, Hashem Hua Elikim. Havaya is Alma de Skasya. Elikim is Alma de Zgalia. Soiviv Kalaman again is Alma de Skasya. Havaya. Mamale Kalaman is Elikim. And Havaya Hua Elikim. Minha Oilam Vada Oilam. Baruch Hashem Elikim Yisrael Minha Oilam Vada Oilam. From this world to this world, because the two are one. So when a person takes his animal soul and he links it, he aligns it, he connects it to the one God. So just like in the Beis HaMikdash, there was a fire below, and there was a fire that came from above, here too, there's a fire from above, the fire of Minha Oilam, Soiv of Kalam, and Alma de Skasia. That's why we say in Shemina Baruch Ata Hashem. The word Baruch, we translate as blessed, but essentially the word Baruch means to draw down. For example, how do you say a pool in Hebrew? Brecha, Brecha, Brecha. It comes from Tanakh, Brecha Smayim, because it's streamed. It's streamed from a wellspring, from a from a canal, from a river, from an ocean. So brecha means you create a channel, a channel from something. And you have in Mishnah is hamavrich es hagefen. You graft a, a vine. Again, you draw it, you bring it into a new place. So baruch atah Hashem. 
from Atta Hashem, there's a baruch, there's a communication, there's a fire. Min ha'olam, va'ad ha'olam. That's why every single bracha again is baruch Atta Hashem saying that you do your work, you bring your animal into the relationship, and Hashem will bring down a fire from above. This will be shayru umizgala ben afshay. It will dwell, it will be manifest in one soul. This is Baruch Ata. Baruch means to graft, to draw down, to bring forth. What do you have to bring forth? Something that's concealed. From concealment to revelation, to the point I could say, Ata, you. Ata is always first person. I, I, could, I, I, I don't say who. Who is when you're not here. I say he, she, who, he. Ata is you're right here. Right? Atas Loshen Noichach. You. I can only say you if you're in my presence. As a result of the animal soul being sublimated into a fire, at every brach I say, Baruch, I'm drawing down something from a place of concealment to the point where I could say, Atta, you, you're here. This is like the heavenly fire that came down on the Mizbech. So in summation, he introduced the concept of, he asked the questions about what was the point of Kriyas Yamsuf. He said that for this we have to understand there is Mitzrayim and Kriyas Yamsuf in every person's life. That's why we constantly have to mention it and remember it. It's a personal story, not only a historical story. And he begins to introduce the concept of Avoide in the Beis Hamikdash, which is one of the pillars of the world. And after the Chorban, it's the concept of Tfila. And just like by the Karbanas, there was the fire the Koyanim brought, but then there was the fire that came from heaven and ate up the Karbanas. Here too, we bring in our Behema into the relationship. And as a result of that, there's Baruch Ata. There's a revelation, there could be a communication from something deeper, min ha'olam, vada oilam, from soiviv into mamale, from alma de eskasya into alma de eskalya, from avaya into elekin. But what does this mean? Good question. Ubiring in the explanation is, ki hinei omer azal de gemara says in chulin, kol ma she yesh baya bosho, yesh bayam. Big yisoid of chazal, that whatever exists, in dry land, also exists by Yam. I'm sorry, yeah, it's not completely two separate worlds. That's not what happens. Rather, if it's by Abosha, it's also by Yam. This is a Gemara in Chuland of Kufchov Zion. And the Gemara continues, in other words, when you come to the ocean, when you come to the beach, all you see is the waterbed. You don't see anything else. Maybe you see a few fish swimming close to the surface. But don't be deceived. Because if you go a little deeper, you'll see there's a whole universe there. Whatever you have, bayabasha, you have bayam. It doesn't mean literally whatever you have, yabasha. I don't think you have this shtibol bayam. At least it doesn't look this way. It means... Every, every, every type of creature, you have, you have some parallel to it. You have some uh, uh, mirror of it, some uh, replica of it in one form or another that exists by Yam. But the point is, it's a whole universe. And just like our universe is so diversified with so many types of creatures in so many different forms of categories, the human race and the animal kingdom and the botanic kingdom and the inanimate matter, Etc., etc. In Yam, there's also a Gansavelt. So, Yam, but, but, this is the Yam and this is the Yabosha. So, he says, Yam, Ubchines Almedes Kasia, the Yabosha, Ubchines Almedes Galia. Yam is the physical reflection of what we call in, in, in Kabbalah and in Hasidus Almedes Kasia. Yabosha, dry land, this is the physical manifestation of what we call Almedes Galia. And we say, Kol yesh b'yam, yesh b'yabosha. Whatever you have here, you have there. But here it's Isgalia, it's revealed, and here it's Iskasia, it's eclipsed. What's the difference between Yam, between the sea, and dry land physically? Sha'abruyim she'biyam einam nirim l'chutz, ki ayam echas Today we know what's happening in the ocean. It's a ganze Welt, but nothing is conspicuous. 
Everything is covered by water. So you don't see anything. Unless you take a deep dive and you go deep down and it's not easy, then you could start seeing what's happening. But from the outside, the way we see it, everything is covered. Not because there's nothing there. There's so much there. <laughs> Most of the earth is there. However, Hayam Echasale, Vigam, furthermore, Chayusam Vikiyumam Ubitoy Chayam Dafke. The amphibious creatures, the creatures that live in the ocean, their life, their vitality is only in the Yam. Vyevshalem Lichyez Bayabasha, Shemiyad Mesim. You take the fish out of the water, he perishes immediately. They can't live in Yabasha. So number one, you don't see them. They're completely covered by the water. But it's not just they're covered by the water. Their whole life is from the water. And if you separate them from the water, even for a few moments, they have no chayas, they have no key. What about creatures on dry land? It's a whole different story. The earth produces all the vegetation, all the trees, all the produce. But the the trees and the bushes and the plants grow out of the earth. They grow above from the earth. They're not submerged in the earth. Although they all receive nurture from the earth. But you don't see them as just part, as one thing of the earth. They appear to be distinct entities. A yesh means a being, but something independent. This is even trees and bushes and plants, fruits. <laughs> Certainly other creatures that are not organically connected to the soil. All the other creatures that have a living soul, in other words, animals and humans, everybody needs the earth. We come from the earth, the earth is our mother, we live of the earth, we need the earth, we're connected to the earth. But are we submerged in the earth? <laughs> Thank God we're not. At this point, we're separate from the earth. We're detached from the earth. And not only that, modern man has found a way to spend days suspended in mid-air, what we call on an airplane, completely separated from the earth. But even if you're walking on top of the earth, you're not, mom, you don't have, you're not mamish on the earth. And even if you're mamish on the earth, you're still above it. In other words, there is a conspicuous identity of earthly creatures separate from the earth. In another Mimer, there is an additional detail. It's not just creatures in ocean, the waters are in the water, and creatures on the earth are on top of the earth. It's exact, it's exact the opposite. What for water creatures spells life, for earthy creatures spells death. Because if the fish is not under the water, if the fish is on top of the water, it can't survive. But if a human being or an animal is in the earth, it's impossible to live. In fact, the definition of death is, that's when a person goes back into the earth. So what spells life for Yam, spells death for Yabosha. What spells life for Yabosha, spells death for Yam. For them to live, they have to be completely eclipsed, submerged. They have to be in the mikveh 24-7. For a man to be in a mikveh 24-7, that's because that's death. I have to be out of the earth. I have to be on top of the earth. Fakert, a grave, a cave, Rahman al after 120 years, that's when the person, offer out of Allah for Tasha because they're not living anymore. What does this then mean? So now we'll understand. Now we'll understand the distinction between Almadis Kasi and Almadis Galya. And let me give an intro what the Altar Rebbe is going to explain. There's two ways of experiencing life. 
If you're a soul from Alma de Escasia, you experience life one way. If you're a soul from Alma de Escasia, you experience life a different way. Just like if you're a fish, life means one thing. And if you're a dog, or an elephant, or a human being, life means something else. And you can't compare the two lives. So within humans themselves, within souls themselves, you could be living in two worlds. And when we say two worlds, we don't mean physically two worlds. One world here and one world is 180 billion light years away. No, the same world, but with two different perceptions. One is a, just like I can have glasses, different perceptions. One person has a pair of lenses and you see one thing. Another person has tinted lenses, sees tinted glasses, sees something else. I could see the world from a perspective of Alma de Escasia and Alma de Esgalia. What's the difference? In Alma de Escasia, let's remember the physical marshal. The physical marshal, what did he say about the physical marshal? Number one, you don't see any creature. All you see is water. Number two, the creatures that are there are submerged in the water. If you take them out for a moment, they can't live anymore. It's not that there's nothing there. You have millions of creatures, but you don't see any creature. All you see is water. And if you take them out, they can't live. What does this mean in Ruchnes? What's this? This would be a perception of the world that everything is actually one. All you see is the water that covers everything. Because you recognize that there's a oneness in all of existence. What type of oneness in all of existence? Since, since the whole world... That was, that, was not a, uh, that was not a water-like creature. That sounded like a bird. But we're still in Alma de Escasia, so keep that on, on silence for a few moments. And then when we get to Alma de Escasia, you'll take it out. <laughs> when, you have, when you have, since the whole world comes from one source, what's that source? Hashem Echad. So Alma de Escasia means a very sensitive perception where I don't see anymore you and you, and you, and you, and me. All I recognize is the water. The Rambam, at the end of Mishnah Torah, describes the time of Mashiach. So he brings a Pasuk from Yeshaya Hanavi, the famous period that we read, Achir and Shal Pesach. Lo yoreyu v'lo yashchisu b'chol har kachi. The wolf shall lie with the lamb. Why? Ki? Why won't they kill each other? Ki? Molo ha'aretz deyes Hashem. The world will be filled with divine consciousness like the water covers the seabed. So it's not just a, a dogma that the water covers the seabed completely and the earth will be covered with divine consciousness. Yeshaya Novi is saying a very profound metaphor. He's explaining what's going to happen. The reason we fight, the reason we don't get along, the reason we're jealous of each other, the reason we're afraid of each other is because we don't have the perception of Alma de Esgalia. We don't see the achtos. We don't see the oneness. Every creature is separate. Everybody is distinct. In Alma de Esgalia, what you see is the water. In other words, what you see is the godliness, the divine energy that fills every heartbeat, every snowflake, every blade of grass, every beating heart, every grazing animal, every droplet of rain, every pebble, every rock, every stone, every nose, every experience. There is a oneness. You see water. Now, it's not that the water obliterates differences. There's still the whale and the salmon. There's still the tuna and the carp. There's still the tilapia and the chili and sea bath. I'm not going to now do pkeus of uh, thousands of species of fish. But you get the point. And I don't have to tell good Jews that you can't compare tilapia to tuna. Chalil of It's a different world. But when I come to the ocean, all I see is water. In other words, recognizing the oneness of Hashem doesn't mean there's no you, there's no me, there's no differences. But what I recognize is not the difference. What I recognize is the oneness that pervades and permeates and encompasses all. It's just achtos. And why is that? Because everyone feels if you take them out of the water, they can't live. This is a level of consciousness where I know what does it mean to live. To live means that I'm completely in oneness, in dveikos, in connection with Hashem's energy which is compared to the water. 
And if for one moment I'm detached from that energy, I consciously can't live anymore. So life equals oneness with God. That is life because I recognize there is one source of life. There is one source of vitality. And therefore my life means that there is a seamless flow between the source and me. So creatures in the sea are a metaphor of somebody whose perception is that there is oneness that pervades all of existence. And what does life mean? Life means I'm completely submerged in that source. I'm just an expression of that source. I'm a continuum of that source. Alma Galia is the exact opposite. In Alma Galia, I see you and I see you. I walk outside. I see there's a sidewalk and there's a car. There's a tree and there's a store. There's a person and there's a dog. There's a cat and there's a frog. There's a pebble and there's a rock. There's a leaf and there's a trunk. And everything has its own distinct identity. Is it not all one? Is it not all receiving its energy from Hashem? It is. Just like we all receive our energy from the earth. But what we see is distinctiveness. And if you would take all these creatures and you would say, go into your source, go into the earth, they wouldn't be able to live. Because the definition of our life is that we feel separate, we feel detached. That is our life. And only after our death do we go back into the source. So what for Alma de Skassia is life, would for us be the cessation of life. And what for us is life is for Alma de Skassia death. You understand? For what for us is life is that sense of separateness. I am. That's what Alma de Skassia deals with. I am. There's I. And there's you. It's two, two, it's two, that's what I mean, two worlds. It's two perceptions, it's two ashkafas, it's two perspectives. This is Yabasha, and this is Yam. <laughs> the Pasuk says in Iyav, Mipsari Echza Elika. From my flesh shall I perceive Hashem. So the Alter Rebbe always uses this posik to bring out that the human condition, the human chemistry, is a, the best way to understand Eleika. Mipsari, from studying yourself, your own flesh, Echze Eleika, that's how you come to know the Rebbe Nishalot. Sheyesh b'neshama seichel midas. The neshama has what's called seichel intellect, what has midas emotions. Vaseichel nechlek legimel, vamidas lezayin. Seichel itself, there's three chambers, there's Chachma, Bina, Das, conception, comprehension, application. Hamidus Lazayin, there's seven Midas, Chesed, Gvura, Tiferes, that's Nechad Yisoyed Malchus. Different personality traits, different emotional faculties. Chesed is the ability to love, and Gvura is discipline, and Tiferes is empathy, and Netzach is victory, and Hoyd is consistency, and Yisoyed is bonding, and Malchus is leadership. Seven different Midas. On top of these seichel and midas, there are three cloaks. Thought, speech, action. Thought, speech, action are not emotions. Thought, speech, actions are garments. They're instruments through which we express ourselves. You can change your thoughts. You can change your words. You can change your actions. They're like suits. They're like uh, the clothes you wear. They badek. They cover the seichel and the midas. V'gam heim is chalkem lepratim rabim. And of course, in Machshav Maisa, there's endless pratim and details. You want to dissect your thoughts, your patterns of thinking, your patterns of speech, your patterns of behavior. There's pratim rabim. Or beklolen heim heipchines. But generally, if you want to talk about a soul, we could speak about five categories. Seichel, midis, machshav edibura maisa. Intellect, cognition, awareness. What are you aware of? Emotional responses, thoughts, words, and actions. Just on these five levels, we can uh, sit a few nights you want to understand yourself, you have to know five things about yourself. First of all, your thinking patterns. Your, not your, your awareness, your levels of seichel. What are you, how do you process things? What is your level of awareness? How do you understand life? How do you understand yourself? Everyone has a context of their seichel. Then there's midas. What are your emotional responses? When you come home tonight and your wife is going to make a comment, whatever that comment is, what is going to be your emotional response? It's not based on what she said ever. It's based on your awareness of things, on how you define reality based on your seichel. We spoke in the Tanya classes a lot about this. Then you have to be aware of your thoughts, your words, and your behavioral actions. Those are the five dimensions of life. 
If you can master those five, you're good off. So we have five le- dimensions. The kama minim, the keneged nefesh ruach neshama chayichida. In Zoyar, Medrash says it's five levels of the soul, and here he associates it with seichel midas machshava dibra ma'isa. According to this maimer, nefesh is ma'isa, ruach is dibur words, neshama is machshava, chaya is midos, and yechida is seichel. Other maimerim there are different explanations, but this is how it's in this maimer. Here he's paraphrasing a pasuk from Kaihelas. There's so many levels of souls. There's so many. De- every person is a veld, but everyone operates within this modality. We all have seichel. Seichel is your intellect, your cognition, new things that you learn and old things that you learned. Your intellectual paradigms. Through which your awareness is it, through which you experience the world and yourself. There's midais and then there's machshav de There's so many madregas, but everyone has these five. Your awareness is not my awareness. Your emotions are not my emotions. And it's really fascinating. You know, you walk down the street and you see, you walk in Manhattan, you see thousands of people, right? Well, thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people. Today, everybody's on a cell phone walking, and everyone in their mind is the center of the universe, right? One guy walked out of an office, he just lost $10 million. Another guy walked out of an office, he just made $10 million. Another guy walked out of an office, he's dreaming about making $10 million. Another guy just got divorced, another guy just got married, another guy is going to the therapy, a guy is coming from therapy. One guy is celebrating, one guy is... But everyone in his mind does his develop. This is me. This is because it's my seichel midas machshavat ibramayz. It's my orbit. It's my planet. You're in your planet. Everyone is different. Yes, and now he goes. Yes, mishoivet b'pchinas madregas klois hanefesh. Chuli. He doesn't elaborate. Al Tadeb's examples of distinctions of personalities. It's a little different than what I gave. There's one madrega. He's in a state of klois hanefesh. Somehow I don't see that in Manhattan so much. But that's one p'china. Even the neshama on its own, without the body. Don't think it's only because of the body. Even in Gan Eden, it's a soul without a body. Every soul has its own veld. Ah, however, the point is that there's a general distinction to be made here. Yes, man, b'pchinas alma, this gal yashinirim ha-madregas mefrodim begilui. In all of these souls, the common denominator is Shenidim Hamadregis Mufrodim Begilu. They take a look at their Seichel, Midois, Machshava, Dibura, Maisa, and each level of identity is distinct. And then you have souls that are in Almadis Kasya, they're in the water meaning. They're completely submerged. Their whole identity is submerged in their sores. This is what's called of Kalalman, the Kula Kamei in whose presence nothing has Chashivus as an independent thing outside of Hashem. Keloi Chashiv, don't translate it, Keloi Chashiv, it doesn't exist. Keloi Chashiv. It doesn't have a chashivus as something outside of Hashem. It's co- why? Because you feel that, as he said, it's completely one with its source. This is the p'china of Moshe. So you have two souls. All these madregas we spoke, that's all a symptom of Almadez Galia. Almadis Galia means there is a diversified world, and within the person there is diversity. This comes from what we call Memale Kalam. Almadis Gasya comes from a consciousness called Soiv of Kalam. An example for this would be take this cup. I'm holding here a cup. This cup has many dimensions. There's tea in this cup. You may have put sugar in the cup, you may have put milk in the cup. So there's a mixture of different liquids. You didn't, but you may have. There's the quality of the cup. There's the height of the cup. 
the depth, the width, the length, etc. And this is not such a complex creature. But there is diversity, there's different parts. The same is true with the table, the same is true with the safer, the same is true with your body, the same is true with any substance. Everything has its dimensions and its differentiated points. But imagine, imagine, in your mind you imagine an object. You know, sometimes you're daydreaming, as some of you are probably doing right now, and you're thinking about something. That something that you're thinking about, you could be imagining your child or your house or your car or your tree or your business, and it's all there in your mind. But there it's completely submerged in your mind, and it's just one thought. There's no differentiation. This is a metaphor for Saiv of Kalam. Mamale Kalaman and Saiv of Kalaman parallels with Almadiz Gali and Almadiz Kas. Mamale Kalaman means the way Hashem fills the worlds. Saiv of Kalaman means the way Hashem surrounds the worlds, encompasses the worlds. What does it mean, surrounds the worlds? Mamale Kalaman is a metaphor. It means there is the divine energy, the way it's custom made, the way it's tailor made to the individual identity of each creature. Just like the soul. There's the way the soul expresses itself in the arms, and in the legs, and in the abdomen, and in the brain, of course, and in the nose. And each one captures a different energy of the soul. The soul on its own is one spiritual, undifferentiated ident- entity. But in the body, each limb channels a certain dimension of the soul. Mamala Kalalman is the way Hashem allows His energy to be custom-made, tailored, designed, individually to every single creature in a different way. The animal, the human, what type of animal? Every creature, every creation has its own chemistry, its own DNA, its own structure, its own brain, its own soul, its own energy. And this is what creates differentiation. Ich bin ich und du bist du. That comes from Amalek Alam. And Hashem fills the world. What does it mean, fills? He fills it like a hand fills the glove, like the water fills the cup. In other words, he accommodates. It's the energy that's suitable, that sustains and designs and creates the individual image of every single creature as is. And when you're in touch with that, you're in touch with Alma de Galia, meaning you may recognize that you have a source, but what you recognize is your distinction, your individuality, your identity. This is Mamala Kalalman. Saiv of Kalalman means there's a divine energy that is infinite and it encompasses the whole world as one, like the water bed, like the water that covers the entire ocean and all of the creatures are part of it, are submerged in it. This is the divine energy that's not tailor-made. It's not custom-made. It's not individuated between one creature and another creature. That's the divine energy that's limited and it shrinks itself and it becomes suitable according to each creature independently. Saif of Kalalman is, it's ain't saif, it's infinite. It's like when your mind imagines an object and your mind now encompasses all the dimensions of the object as one. Physically, I can't embrace this whole room. Everything has its own chalakim, its own, but in my mind, I can have this whole room in my mind, the basachas. That would be saiv of kalaman. But saiv of kalaman is, in other words, Hashem's energy that permeates the whole world is a oneness. And when you're from that neshama, from Amad Eskasya, you're sensitive to saiv of kalaman, and therefore all you see is the water. And therefore, the definition of life is complete oneness, complete being submerged in the source. And the word he uses here is p'telem b'metziyiz b'mekoyrem. And this is important. Sometimes it's translated p'telem b'metziyiz b'mekoyrem means they're, they're nullified. That's how it's usually translated, but it's, it's, not, the, it's not the best translation. P'telem b'metziyiz b'mekoyrem means they're completely one with their source. They see themselves in context of their source. As he puts it, the kula kamei kaloi chashiv. In his presence, there is no chashivas to something outside, to something separate, to something independent. The chashivas of everything is as an extension of the water. It's all part of Hashem's energy. It's all part of Hashem. This is Moshe. That's why Moshe is called Moshe. Kimin hamayim mishisiu. It's a father. Moshe had a father. Moshe had a mother. 
find Jewish people. They gave him names. The Medrash says in Vayikra that Moshe's father and his mother gave him ten names. Whose name do we know? We don't even know his names. I mean, we know Yekusi, El Tuvia. But which name was chosen? Basia's name. Moshe. What was her name? Kimin Hamayim Mishisuyu. Because I drew him out, I drew him, I drew him out of the water. No, she happened to have taken him out of the water. That becomes his name etern- for eternity. A name captures the essence of the person, the essence of the soul. Moshe happened to be in a basket in the water, and Batya happened to have retrieved him. So she named him Moshe, come in a Miami, she see. But why is that his name? Does that capture the essence of his personality? It's an important event that happened in the beginning of his life, a crucial event. But why is that his name? Now we understand. Moshe's essence, even when he was on dry land, is he was a water creature. When you looked at Moshe, you say, he's not familiar. He comes in Amayimishisiyu. That's why it was hard for him to talk. Moshe was kvat pe, kvat loshen. Why? So we all know the story. You remember the story? He burnt his tongue. But what's the pnimius of it? Why was every story has a pnimius, a depth to it? Why was Moshe the most important communicator in history? Elad varim asher debe Moshe, kvat pe kvat lash couldn't speak. Shepchin is dibur v'his galus nimna mimenu, the way he puts it, the concept of his galus of expression was prevented from his life. Not because Moshe had a disadvantage. The opposite. Moshe was in a state of bitl b'metzius, which means his whole identity was completely aligned with the source. So therefore, naturally, he couldn't communicate, he couldn't speak, because he did not experience himself as something distinct and separate but rather was completely one with its source, and therefore he was always lost. He was always submerged. He was always aligned with that source, and he did not feel that presence that is required to become a teacher, a communicator. What are we? What are we? We're just channels. This was a representation of his bitl b'metzius. When somebody, when you're deeply, deeply engrossed in a thought, when you're trying to figure something out, when you're deeply engrossed in a meditation, you, don't give a, you can't give a speech at that moment. Even when somebody comes and says, talk to me, not now, not now, don't distract me. The way you have it in halacha, it's with meat, but it's also true with people. When you're busy absorbing, you can't emit. To be in a state of speaking, the person is not absorbing. On the contrary, they're in a state of communication. Moshe was always absorbing. Moshe was always submerged in the water. For Moshe to communicate, to speak, was, count, was unnatural. It was opposite of the, very, of the very vibe of his essence. His essence was always in a state of Kabbalah. What was Kabbalah? Why? Why? Not because he knew less, because he knew more. Because he was in touch with that energy of oneness. And because of that, there was no separateness. There was no presence which would allow him to become a medaber, to become a mashpia. Zeu, so now he comes back. Zeu, in yin ha-broch, broch, at oilam v'ad oilam, sh'yi ebchines almedes kasya. Ubchines soif of kalalmen, sh'obchines bitl de kulaka mekeloi choshev, now we understand what Kriyas Yamsuf was all about. For the Jewish people to become a people, before they're going to receive Torah, the first thing that had to happen was the Yam had to split and become Yabasha. You're supposed to figure this out. <laughs> doesn't say so clearly, but this is the Mahalach of the Maimer. The Yam had to become Yabasha. In other words, what usually is water suddenly becomes dry land. The Jewish people are walking but it's Yabasha. 
What's the point? Why did Hashem do this? That was the question of the beginning of the Maimer. And what does this mean in our life? What it means is we are usually submerged, or not submerged, we are usually captivated only by Almadiz Galia. I don't feel my source. You don't feel your source. We feel completely detached. Even if I may learn, even if I may believe, even if I may prove that I have a source. First of all, you may never even discover you have a source. You could walk your planet, this planet, for 80, 90, 100, 130 years and not once feel that we're all part of one source. Not once feel your relationship with your own, with oneness that pervades everything and everybody at every moment. So I'm like completely isolated in my own ego bubble without feeling anything. Even if I'm somebody, I learned about it and I think about it and I dive in with it and I learn it. But is it intuitive? Is it natural? Of course not. If I would be in water, oh, that's life. There's no other life. Here it's the opposite. If I would feel it too much, I wouldn't be living. Living in our world means yes, I feel me. That's what life means in our world. And Hashem wanted it that way. Hashem, Hashem wanted we should be in Almadis Gali, not in Almadis Gali. He created Yabosha, not Yam. There's Yam and there's Yabosha. Moshe was a product when Amayim is see you. He walked dry land. All he saw was Mayim. We're in a perception of Almadis Gali. For Yiddish guy to happen, Jews had to experience once Kriyas Yamsuf. For once, they had to be able to see how the water became dry land. You know, they walked through Bayam Bayabasha. I think there's a word from the Noyam Ali Melech, I think one of the great tzaddikim. He said, the wording is, uh, is, is grammatically difficult. They didn't go in Bayabasha. And it was dry. They didn't go in by, by a bush, means they went into dry land. He says the Pshat is that Kriya Samsa was trying to teach them that they should know forever that that even when they're going by a bush, they're going by Chayam. Even when you're going by a bush, it's really Basai Chayam. It's just Ahmad Galia. This is the perception of Kriya Samsa. It was a paradigm shift. It was that ability to be able to experience life from a place in which you're absolutely one with your source. You're a continuum of your source. There's a seamless flow between Hashem and you. That's what bitl b'metzias means. There are those who explain the word bitl in an unfair way. They explain bitl means you're nothing. You're a shmata. You're not important. <laughs> you're horrible. <laughs> You're evil. You're terrible. Quit while you're ahead. Who do you think you are? Bittal means the opposite. You see here what Bittal means. Bittal means realizing that you're completely one with God. That you're the holiest that can be. You're completely one. That's the truth. Like a creature in water. The, the, fish, the fish is so one with the water. It doesn't think about itself. Not because it doesn't exist. Because itself is completely synonymous with the water. There's a lack of self-consciousness because the self is completely associated with its source. That's what it means. Kula kameka loy chashev. Kula kameka loy chashev means, it's from Zoyar. Everything in his presence doesn't have a chashevus. Here again, you could translate it in two ways. One is kula kameka loy chashev. You don't matter. Your kids don't matter. Your life doesn't matter. Your personality doesn't matter. What you do doesn't matter. Your whole thing doesn't matter. Take out the garbage and remember that you're garbage. That's the main thing. That's not what Kulukamekaloy means exact the opposite. Kulukamekaloy Khashiv means when you realize, when, when from his presence you'll realize that the Khashivus of everything is only that it's part of oneness, that it's part of the divine. The chashivus of everything is recognizing its connection to the yam, its oneness with the yam. The fact that it's a channel for elikus, it's part of Einoid Malvada, you're part of God's oneness. Hashem chose you to be His ambassador in this world. There's something of His light that's coming out through you. And this encompasses every person. And it encompasses all parts of the person. That was Moshe's consciousness. Minamayim Mishisiyu. Kriya Syamsuf 
was that paradigm shift. There was no way they can receive the Torah without that. Because if you receive the Torah without that, ultimately, it's hard to understand what the Torah wants. The Torah keeps on talking about things and you're like, who are you talking to? I'm, I'm a regular person. Only when you understand your mocker and shoyrish, who you are in your pnimius, what you're connected to and what you're capable of, then you can appreciate Matan Torah. So this is the Baruch Atah Hashem to draw down that Alma de Skasia should take root in Alma de Skas in Alma de Zgalia, that Havaya should take root in Elikim, that Saiv of Kalama should take root in Mamalakalam. This is the first step he explains. And now there's one more point that we're going to do, the second paragraph, the next paragraph. One more point. It's clear. Anybody has questions? Okay. Ah, however. Somebody once said, I had an uncle, a great, great, great uncle. His name was Shmuel Levitin. So he once said, anecdotally, as a darshan, can came on the tshuvatan. Which means a speaker, a public speaker, will never ever do tshuva. He can't do tshuva. Why? He said, an ordinary Jew, even if he's apathetic and careless, but once in a while, he'll open up a psasefer, or he'll hear a psadrasha, or a shir, or he'll see something in life, and he'll get the psashtikal chizak, a shtikal isairus, he'll be a raz. Something will happen. He says, but a darshan, if he reads something inspiring, or he hears something inspiring, or something happens to him inspiring, what's his initial thought? Ah, this is gewaldic for the next speech. This is awesome for the next Russia. So he said he, he can never apply it to himself, so he'll never do tshuva. So somebody was once sitting with a darshan at a fabrengen, and he was giving him musa. And he said, you know that a darshan will never do tshuva. And he gives him this whole darshan, and I said, ah, it's a gewaldic award for my next Russia. <laughs> so this is a, uh, a uh, I think this is a, 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 an example of speaking. But... <laughs> It's the energy going outward. Saying this in the middle of a shir is probably a little bit paradoxical. But, uh, but here it's deeper. In other words, it's not just because speaking is often the person doesn't mean it. They're not that the person is just busy projecting. It's about the performance more than about the internal state. He's not even talking about that. That's already a lower level. Even words that are authentic and that are honest... But nonetheless, I have to be in a mode of giving, of communicating. And in the state of Alma de Escasia, the fish doesn't want to be seen. Not because the fish is insecure. Because the fish recognizes what it's part of. It doesn't want to be seen on its own. Because we want to be seen, not because we're confident. Because we're not confident. When you're really, really confident, you don't want to be seen. You understand, yeah? We're not confident, so we have to be seen. Because without that, what do I have? But when you realize who you're really part of, when you realize what you're part of, then you don't want to be seen. You don't want to dilute your truth. You don't want to compromise the energy. You don't want to be, you don't want to be detached. It would like, you'll, like you'll come to a fish. You know, the fish will come to a therapist and say, I'm suffering from insecurity. The therapist says, of course you're suffering from insecurity. All day you're in water. You're embarrassed to come out. Show up. Flex your muscles. Fish says, Gavaldic idea, right? The fish jumps out of the water. Ten minutes later, you zgadalvi yizgadash. Shoita. <laughs> Why should the fish want to leave the water? Celept, celept, celept. When you realize that, that real life is your channel for Hashem, you don't want to be seen. The you that wants to be seen doesn't exist. But when, when, when I don't exist, then I want to be seen. So you have to understand this. Moshe didn't lack confidence. That's not why he spoke. On the contrary, it was a whole different type of identity. It's an identity that comes from realizing how awesome it is not to have an identity. Not because you're a loser, but because on the contrary, because your identity is bottle b'metziyas b'mekayr, because it's part of Ein Saif. So why should you want to be seen? The Tainug, the Ostis Anagel Hashem, 
of experiencing the Ein Sof. Why should you want to detach from that? Mamish like a fish going out of water so that everybody should take a picture of me. When there's nothing but the picture, then I want a picture. And this is true of life. And you have to understand this, that th- this is, these, are, these are subtle distinctions in life. There's two types of bitl, you understand? There's bitl that destroys, and there's bitl that is the most powerful, joyous, pleasurable experience. And it's both the word bitl. You could be mavatl somebody, and you could, you could usually when you mavatl somebody, it's the first type of bitl. You're threatened by them. <laughs> That's why you mavatl them. And then there's a different type of bitl. And the second type of bitl is, is, is the most joyous. It gives you life. It gives you strength. It gives you empowerment. It gives you simcha sachaim. It gives you minucha sanefesh. You're part of Ain't Saif. You don't, you, why should I want to be seen? I'm, I'm just a channel for God. It's, that's existence. Ptelim b'metzius means that you realize your whole identity is part of the water. You don't want to be seen. And it's not a struggle. I don't want to be seen. My eye is l'chatchil, part of God's eye. And, and that, that's what Kriyas Yamsuf is in Avoidah. That's what it means in life. So to go out of Mitzrayim, to really go out of Mitzrayim, you have to be able to experience Kriyas Yamsuf. Now you're going to ask me how. Okay. The first step is understanding a little bit what we're talking about. Let's just learn one more shtickle here. Achkol... <laughs> Remember, how did this all begin? By the Karbonus, you had Koyenim and you had Levim. The Koyenim did the Avoid. What did the Levim do? Not everybody realizes that in the Beis Hamikdash there were two major concerts a day. What concert? Symphonies. So he says, all this, Brachas, Baruch Atta, Brach of Amshacham, Amal, this is all the Koyen. The Baruch Atah, bringing down Almedes Kasset, Almedes Galia, that's the Koya. Avlavoides Alevim Midah Cheres Oisabon. The Levim, they had a different Midah. He Melmata Lamaila. Not going, bringing the higher to the lower, bringing the water consciousness. To the Yabasha consciousness, Soivav to Mamale, no. Mimata Lamaila, going up. The Ksiv, it says in Parshas, Koyrach. It's a strange Pasuk. The Levi should serve, but it says the Levi should serve him. So he teaches Not like the Koyin. The Koyin's avoid was Melmaila Lamata, Baruch Ato. That in Almedes Galia, Viro called Basar, there should be the Hergish of Almedes Kasia. The Levi is Va'avad Halevi, who? Who is the opposite of Atta? It's not Baruch Atta. Who is always third person? He. It's Nister. It's Lashen Nister. Because the Levi operates in Almedes Kasia. What is he searching for? He's searching that Almedes Galia should not become manifested. Like we say, the Pasuk says in Divrei Ayam, we say it every morning in Vayavorech David. Meaning, you are alone. What does it mean, you're alone? A moment later, you tell me, So what's the So here you have the two states. There's Atu Hashem Levadecha. Then there's Atos, he says, Hashem Mayim, Shme Hashem Mayim, Oriz, V'chol Asher Le, V'chol Asher Behem. And then there's Va'ata Mechaya Eskula. So he teaches Atah Hashem Levadecha, She'ei noi begeder almin klal, loi begeder memali v'loi begeder soiviv. This is a profound new nekuda, but the point he's saying is, even soiviv kalalmin doesn't capture God. Because that's all Hashem, the way you're defining Him in terms of a relationship with the world. Either Mamale Kalalman or Saiv of Kalalman. Either he fills the world, meaning he limits his energy according to the specific container of the world, or Saiv if he does not limit his energy. It's a transcendental energy that consumes and, and, and encompasses the whole world. But he himself, Atu Hashem, is Lavadecha. Einoi begeder Alman Kalalman. 
that the truth of Hashem that's completely not defined by the world or by any relationship with the universe. What did the Levim do in the Beis Hamikdash? They used to sing and play instruments every morning, every afternoon. Carbonus Musafim. There was a whole symphony going on. You had Levim who sang. You had Levim who played instruments. You know, minimum twelve Levim. Maximum, you can have hundreds and thousands of Levim. They would stand, it was called the Duchon, the Koyanim Bavidosim, Levim Beduchonim, and they had a lot of instruments. They had violins and harps and flutes and cymbals and trumpets. The Gemara then Erkin describes the the, 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 the the Tanoim and the Nevi'im and the Chachamim were great experts in music, and they instituted exactly exactly which kalim to be used, the number of instruments to be used, how many should be used to create the exact symmetry between the voice, between the choir and the musical instruments and the symphony. Alevi had to train five years before he joined the symphony. There was a whole niggin niggin going on. When we learn about the Vesamik, there's somehow that's a little bit lost, but there was a whole major symphony going on. What was this all about? Shira and niggin, what was this all about? So he's going to explain. Listen to these words. You know, Nigina, music, is a world. It's a universe. It's a whole world. The al Tirebbe, I don't know if you know, was an extraordinary composer. We have a Chashava, we have a Chashava musician. The al Tirebbe was an extraordinary composer. If you'll uh, study his Nigin of Dalit Babas, or Avinu Malkeinu, even Keliata, especially the Dalad Vavis. These are overwhelmingly brilliant, powerful, and incredibly heart-stirring and mind-stirring melodies. Even from a, uh, from, so to speak, a secular point of view, if you want to study these Nigun, he was an extraordinary composer. And here, in this Maimer, Valter Rebbe describes the essence of a Nigun. You'll see words here that you usually don't see about a nigan. I don't know how much we'll be able to understand of it, but let's see what the what the Alter writes. Ki inyin ha nigan hu she'em bo'irak is spilus ha nefesh mipnei gilu ha tenuas. A nigan has only one aspect to it: his spilus ha nefesh. It moves the soul because of the tenuas, because of the 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 modes, the stanzas, the tenuas are the stanzas that become revealed in the nigan. It's not because those stanzas have in them a novel idea. You hear it and you say, Ah, Gvaldik, a new idea. I get it. Wow. Psavort, a kvetch. Psanaya rambam, anaya pshat. A good philosophy, a good Vartan's theology and psychology. No, ain't from Sechel Vizchachos. Elumne Gilia Tnuam is Ere Gilia Lev. Singing, bringing out this Tnuah arouses something in the lay, brings out something in the heart. Valachena Philo Benigun Yashon. Yes, is Ere Ruzviz Pilus, but Ne Gilia Tnuah Shaba. It's a Nigun Yashon. It's an Alta Nigun. You sang it today 50 times. You sang it yesterday 100 times. You've been singing it for 30 years. Was best in the spot. Imagine a Rav gets up and he gives the same sermon for 30 years. Actually, it happens. <laughs> Not in this shul, but it happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They say, I told you when they say that a joke you could repeat, a joke you could repeat uh, twice, twice, you, a joke you could repeat every two years. A story you could repeat every year, and a dvartaira you could repeat twice in the same sermon. But a new vart, you're gonna even a joke is funny, right? But imagine if you heard the joke six times, right? Even if it's the best, the best, the best teller of jokes, you you know the punchline. With a niggin, it's a funny thing. It's the other way around. Once you fall in love with a niggin, you play it again. What do they have? Shuffle. What do you do on the huh? Repeat. You put with the teenagers, have repeat. You probably know from your own homes. If you take the, the headset to your ears. And you'll see they could repeat the same niggin. What, ten times? They could repeat it 900 times till four in the morning till they fall asleep. 
If I can't, the more you love the nigan, the more you want it. So you'll ask them, you normal? Imagine you'll say the same joke, you say the same toity, you say that, I got it already. Unless, it's a new kvetch, but there's no new kvetch in the nigan. It's the same singer, the same nigan over. What happened? So the Alter Rebbe says, you have to say, that what the nigan is not giving you pleasure because it's a good vart, it's captivating, it's mesmerizing, it's a psychos, it's a new hergish, it's a new ashkof, it's a new awareness, it's a new idea, it's a new gedank, it's a new seichel. No. It's reaching a place that's very, very deep in the heart. And the tenuah brings it out. And from that, there's a tremendous inspiration, a tremendous delight, a tremendous pleasure. Kachu inyan avaydes halevi b'shidah. This will allow us to understand what the Levi was. What the Levi was inspired by was the soul being affected and inspired on its own, meaning When this writer wrote Chuli, it was the Alter Rebbe's brother, the Buda Levi, I think he was probably writing fast and, and he assumed that you're going to understand how the, his brother ended the sentence. It's not that the Levi says, let's think, let's meditate, let's do his boinanos, and from the, his boinanos will develop an emotion. No, that's not what a nigan is. That's not what a nigan is. A nigan is not about, we're going to think through an idea, and as a result of that, we're going to get inspired. That's not the Levi. Why? Because the Levi is not being moved by a hasaga that's going to create a hergish. Who? Because va'ava da levi who pchines ato who Hashem levadoch levadecha the leis machshavet fisse beklal. What the levi is looking for is the ato who Hashem levadecha. That nekude that it says in Zoyar, no thought can grasp him at all. So no comprehension, no his boyness, no feeling can grasp him. He's looking for the Atu Hashem Levadech. So let's understand. Mamali Kalalmin. Ultimately, I can have some level of appreciation. I look at the world and I say, Ah, Marabu Masach Hashem. Study a tree. You'll be moved. Study a blade of grass. You'll be moved. Study your digestive system. Study what it takes for you to listen to a word. Study what it takes to pick up your finger. You'll be moved. You'll be impressed. That's all Mamali Kalalmin. That's God shrinking his energy, restricting it to the point that it creates diversified creatures in an endlessly brilliant way that we still can't fathom. Soiv of Kalalman is a deeper awareness. Soiv of Kalalman is the way Hashem's energy is not limiting itself according to each creature individually, but that there's a oneness like the Yam that encompasses and permeates and penetrates all of the creatures as one because of his infinite energy. But over here, there can also be some type of hasaga, some type of sensitivity. But the Levi knows that there's atu Hashem levadecha. There's you alone completely beyond even being grasped in terms of infinity. Infinity is also some type of definition. There's finite and then there's infinite. I can appreciate the disparity. So what does the Levi do? The Levi sings. What's the singing? The singing is not about hasaga. He wants to touch on the kudah that less machshavet tfisa bekla. I don't want to think. The levi doesn't want to think. Liberate me from thoughts. I want to be one with the one that I can't grasp. Not even in terms of soiv of kalalman. That's where the nigan comes in. I want to grasp that which I can't grasp. I want to completely go out of myself. I'm not looking for a vart. I'm not looking for a vertel. I'm not looking for a Chiddush. So the Levi sings. In that singing, there's a spilus hanefesh, as he describes. He has a spilus ruusa de liba. Ruusa de means rotsen alev, shayi in a geyad hanefesh, nakudus alev, eloi li is pchinus makif levan. He doesn't only want this should be makif, which means superficial, but he wants that the essence of his soul should be one with that oneness. Val ze, val dvar ze, val derech ze, niskin psuki de zimre koidem krishna. Before Krishna, we have Psuki de Zimra. This is the substitute for the Leviyah. Till Baruch Sha'amar, we discuss all the Karbonas. That's the Kayanim. 
And then Baruch Shama, we go to the Levian. Mizma Lesoid, and the whole Psuki de Zimra. What Zimra? Zimra means a Nigin. Well, the Chen Kairin, I some Psuki de Zimra. Shein Kain Pchinis Nigin. People say you're saying the same Psuki de Zimra for 20 years, 30 years, 60 years. What's the, Again, hallelujah? You're going to say, tell me again, hallelujah? Shu Kain Pchinis Nigin. Shu Rak Har Chavas Hadibur. Ubira Inyin. He says, Psuki de Zimra is not trying to make Chidushim. Psuki de Zimra is trying to sing. It's trying to bring out a song. Harchavas Hadibur, elaborating the words. Ubiir inyan betois vis beer, la fadish adover, hatev, la halev, libay venafshe she yispal baza. It's trying to tickle your heart. It's trying to move you. Okay, we didn't move you with yich void. Let's try again. I want to move you. I want to move you that there's something higher, there's something deeper. You're not a brute, beastly, lowly, despicable animal as you think you are. You're not just an insecure, wounded creature. There's something more. This I want to just. I, we try to tickle again. It's like the same niggin again and again. She is spoiled, Mizay. You should be moved. Mashenkin shaymer apsukim ve'enu negel in a kudus lavave. Ein zebchin a zimra ve'niggin ve'ein zavay the tama. If you're just saying the psukim, even if you know what you're saying, but you don't dare hear that it's a niggin. It's not a zimra. It's not a song. It's not a song. There's no outpouring of the heart. Like by a niggin, it's not the wholesome avoid. Bezeu ashira l'ashem ki goi go. Ashira l'ashem. I'm going to sing. Why sing? Why not give a shir? Ki goi go. Pirush. Shepchin es ashira hu mipnei ki goi l'may l'may go. You know when I sing, when I realize ki goi go. Go hu pchin es soiv of kalam and the kulaka make a loichashem. He's exalted. He's above. He's infinite. So when you say go on, it encompasses all the worlds as one. There's an in it's all exception of what can make. It's like everything is still. You can't say the water doesn't have a relationship. This is defined by the ocean. There's a size to the water. Even save of what? From the context of the universe that God transcends the limitations of the universe. But it's in that context. And then there is lace machshavet tfisa beiklal, that core essence. Pchines atohu Hashem levadecha. We are alone. And this is what we say in the piyut. Loi naroich elov k'tushosai. So listen to his type. How does everybody translate loi naroich elov k'tushosai? We can't estimate. We can't give a value, an erech to his k'dusha. Says the Altarebbe Pirush. Sha'afilu k'dushosai. Sha'u kodesh umuvdo loi naroich elov. Even his k'dusha is not be'erech to him. Loi narech elov k'tushasai means even when you talk about him as Kadosh. Kadosh means muvdal, aloof, sublime, infinite, soiv of kalam, and alma deskasya. Loi narech elov k'tushasai, his k'dush also doesn't define him. It's also shaloi barech, it's also completely not comparable to him. Because even the fact that he's aloof is not God. When you describe Hashem as being aloof and infinite, you're not describing God. You're describing something important, but not God. Hashem is not physical, but he's also not spiritual. He's not the world, but he's also not above the world. And the Levi wanted to touch that. But because you can't describe it as, as physical, you also can't describe it as spiritual, you also can't describe it as being far or as being close. It's not far and it's not close. And therefore, it could be very close, just like it could be very far. It, it, it's there, it's there. Even the word there doesn't describe it. That's what the Levi was touching. So the Kayan is bringing the carbon. The Kayan is the Jew saying every day by davening, Baruch Atah Hashem. The Kayan is the one who's operating in Alma de Zgalia, but he wants to bring Alma de Zgalia into Alma de Zgalia. That's the Kayan. The Levi is the Pchin of Atu Hashem Levadecha. This is where you stop speaking. He even stops doing the Avoida and he starts singing. Ashir al Hashem ki goi go. Moshe was a levi. Moshe is kimin hamayim mishisiyu. He comes from water. So Moshe Rabbeinu is the one who creates Kriya Siamsov. Moshe gives the Jew a taste of bringing Almadis Kasi into the Almadis Galia. And then there's the Va'avad Halevi who. 
What does the Vavad Halevi who teach the Jew? The Vavad Halevi who says, he sings. He doesn't say. Ashir al Hashem ki goi ga. He's goi of being goi. He's exalted over being exalted. Goi ga. Loi nara chelav ktushasai. And this is where singing comes. This is the complete intimacy with the oneness that no thought can grasp and therefore no words can express. That's the psuke de zimra. That's the nigan of the levia. You know the maise with the majitze, yeah? The majitze rebbe, the bisrol taub. You know, majitze, nigan is very powerful. In Tofresh Ayin Gimel in 1913, he traveled to Berlin, the Majid Sereb, traveled to Berlin. He was suffering from sugar and he needed a surgery. In Berlin, there were great doctors. They said, You must have surgery. There was a problem. He was too weak to have anesthesia. So they couldn't perform it. So, you know what he told them? He said he's going to compose on Nigan and they should watch him. And when he's in the midst of the nigin, they should perform the surgery. And then he performed, he composed the famous, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it has, it has uh, 32 stanzas, yeah? How many stanzas does it have? I saw someplace a 72 stanzas, somebody wrote 44 stanzas. It has dozens and dozens of stanzas, and they performed the surgery successfully. Ad kach. They performed the surgery without anesthesia because his body couldn't take it. That was his Kaya Chanagin. There's a story about al Terebe that he once traveled to a city called Shklov. Shklov is in the Lita, in Lithuania. Belarus, Lita. Depends who won the war that Monday. If it was Russia or Lithuania or Poland. So he once in Shklov. Shklov was one of the greatest fortresses of Talmud Chachamim in the Lita. There was Vilna and there was Shklov. It's was was also a fortress of a lot of opposition to Hasidus in the early years. But when Alter Rebbe came to Tishklov, his name was already quite well known as a tremendous gun in Nigla and Halacha. So they, uh, the, but it was still, it was difficult because, you know, he was, he was a student of the Magad, he was the founder of Chabad Chassidus. So he came into the Beis Medrash, they right away uh, surrounded him with kashas, questions, questions, questions. So the Alter Rebbe said, instead of answering everybody's question individually, why don't we make a time, we'll meet, and I'll speak at the bell, we'll I'll give a shear. So they made a time, everybody came to the main shul in Shklov. Alter Rebbe went up to the bim, after hearing hundreds and hundreds of questions. He stands up and he says, the Mishnah says in Masech to Shabbos, Kol Baalei HaSher, Yoitzin B'Sher, V'nim Shachim B'Sher. Sher means a, uh, a collar. So all animals, bali hashir, all animals that that go out with a collar, yoitzin b'sher. So even on Shabbos they can go out to the street with a collar, v'nim shachin b'sher, and you can uh, you can schlep them, you can draw them, you can move them with with, with a sher as a collar. It's not a problem of carrying on Shabbos. So the Rebbe said sher means a collar, but sher shin yud reish is a nigin. It says kol bali hashir. All those who are shayech to nigin, bali hashir, the owners of music, which are neshamas and malachim. Yoitzin b'sher v'nem shachim b'sher. Whenever they want to go out of themselves, yoitzin, they want to go out of themselves to go to a higher place. They want to relocate themselves. They want to go out of their, of their bubbles, of their containers to go to a new place. It's always through a nigan. V'nem shachim b'sher. And whenever they want to bring down something, they want to create a hamshacha. Yoitzin is melmata l'mayla, to go upwards. And hamshacha is to internalize, to bring around this b'sher with a nigan. And he started to sing a nigan. This was his shir. And he started to sing his nigan. And he sang for a very long time. It was known that Rebbe's koil was like a lion. It was an unbelievable, very powerful voice. And there was a divinity. There was a godliness there. And the whole shul, this wasn't something that happened in Shklov uh, on a regular Wednesday. Trust me. This was quite a novel experience. I could just imagine the scene. But... Uh, the crowd was transfixed from the Kayach HaNegin. And they all went into this, you know, spiritual state of ecstasy. And the Rebbe sang for a very, very long time. And everyone said afterwards that every kasha that he had was answered during the Negin. And the Chassidim that were there used to call it the Matan Teire Negin. 
because it was like a nigan through which so much Torah came into the world. How, do, how were their questions answered? If I have a question, I have a question. So the Baal Shem Tov once said, any question you'll tell me, I'll give you an answer. And any answer you'll tell me, I'll give you a question on the answer. Because what's a question in one world, in a higher world becomes an answer. But what's an answer in one world, in yet a higher world, is a question. And so it goes deeper and deeper. As he says there, there's Mamale, there's Sayyid, there's Kulakame. What the Nigan did was, it created an openness called Bali Hashe Yaitzim Bashir, that they can go out of themselves. And there was an openness, a psichas hamaychen, a psichas alev, a deeper part of the soul comes out. There's a certain, there's a, a, a nekuda of the nefesh that emerges. And once that emerges, so things that you didn't see yesterday, you see today. Things that you couldn't understand yesterday. You may have heard it for 20 years, but it didn't click. You know the information, but you don't have the wisdom. And it clicks because a, a deeper part came out and you perceive things that you couldn't perceive. This is not about, it's not a miracle. It's not magic. It's not a chiddish. It's the point is that you, you get opened up to a certain fuse, to a certain dimension of yourself that you never knew about. The nigan brings that out. And when that comes out, you're capable of understanding things that you didn't understand, of feeling things you didn't understand, of perceiving things that you didn't understand. So in conclusion, what's the nikud of Kriyas Yamsav? Why did Kriyas Yamsav have to happen? Kriyas Yamsav had to happen because the Achana from Atan was... The point of learning how to create some type of synthesis, some type of shidduch, some type of uh, connection between Alma de Eskasya and Alma de Esgalia. Alma de Eskasya, the world of complete oneness, of complete vekos, and Alma de Esgalia, the world which we, in which we popul- populate with our consciousness of complete diversity and differentiation to the point that they could walk inside that yam in the Alma de Eskasya and suddenly it was exposed. What's usually only concealed and available only for the creatures of the sea was exposed uh, for mankind. So now let's finally see how everything works together. This Mimer is still not over. The Mimer continues and develops a whole other profound idea. And based on what Dr. Rebbe explains at the end of the Mimer, we could now at last see how the different ideas fit together. Because the great question now is, how can we indeed integrate the two worlds, Alma de Eskasi and Alma de Esgalia, which are so different from each other? How can you synthesize the amphibious soul with the terrestrial soul? The soul that is submerged in water, so to speak, and the soul that exists on dry land. There is the soul that recognizes differentiation, individuality, identity, detachment. And then there is the soul that sees itself and everything else simply as a channel of Hashem's oneness. So ultimately, there's no distinction between you and me because each one of us is an expression of that oneness of Hashem that pervades all of existence, save of Kalalman. How can you combine that perception of Amadez Kasya with the perception and experience of Amadez Galya? They seem too, they seem paradoxical. And yet, Dr. Rebbe is explaining, this is the whole objective of Kriyas Yamsuf, that you walk into the sea and yet the sea becomes dry land. In other words, Alma de Iskasya becomes Alma de Isgalia. The concealed world, the world in which the ego is completely concealed and submerged, experiencing the self as part of the divine self, and therefore experiencing the organic oneness in the universe. That world becomes Alma de Isgalia. It becomes exposed. What do we mean exposed? That we integrate that into our individual identity. In other words, there's two ways of living. One way of living is Alma de Eskasya, meaning you're not exposed, you're concealed. What does it mean you're concealed? You're completely in dveikos, in oneness with your source. And one is Alma de Eskasya, where your identity is detached and it's revealed as a separate being. It now doesn't have the experience, the mesikos, the beauty, the sweetness of Bittl B'Metzius. And that's the life that most of us inhabit, at least most of the time. Kriyas Yamsuf is the idea of synthesizing those two worlds. How can you? How can you, into your individual self, introduce that concept of oneness, which is the objective of Kriyas Yamsov? The answer is only by introducing the third dimension. Atuhu Hashem Levadecha. The third dimension that Dr. Rebbe just discussed, that Hashem is not defined by physicality, but He's also not defined by spirituality. Even the idea of Kedusha does not capture His essence. Even the idea of sublimity, transcendence, infinity... 
which demands full cessation of a separate being, even that does not capture his essence. His undefined essence can combine the two worlds of Almadis Galia and Almadis Gassia, meaning that in my daily routine, living with my individual identity, living with my yesh, I can align it with the oneness of Hashem. Only when I introduce the third quality of Atahu Hashem Levadecha, there the two worlds can come together. Ah, now let's understand what happens. So when the Jewish people see the splitting of the sea, in other words, when they see the synthesis of Almadis Gassi and Almadis Galia, what's the response? Now the response is song. What is song? We just explained. Song is not something that can be captured in words. Song is not something that can be captured through ideas. Song is not about another idea, another method, another mechanism. Song is about something that no thought can grasp. You can't articulate it. It just moves the essence of the soul. When they see the synthesis of Alma Discuss and Alma Galia, they're seeing something that can't be defined and grasped by words. Leis Machshavat Fisa Beiklau. The response is Ashir Lashem. Why? Ki Goi Go. Because we saw something that's beyond Go. We saw something that's beyond Save of Kalalman. In other words, Kriyas Yamsov, the synthesis of the two worlds, evokes. That song of the Levim, Psuke de Zimra, which is why when do we say the Shira every morning in Shachris? This is the climax, this is the peak of Psuke de Zimra, of our song, the song that celebrates the synthesis between Alma de Skasi, Alma de Zgalia, Saibav Kalaman, Mamala Kalaman, Hashem Hu Alekim, the amphibious soul and the terrestrial soul. Have a wonderful night. <laughs> Do